What's good, Knicks Nation? Alex Terrace here, a.k.a. the Tratocaster, back again with another Game of the Week preview. This time we got the New York Knicks at home at Madison Square Garden taking on the Dallas Mavericks for a nice matinee game, 12.30 p.m. this Saturday. And we're going to break it down, but make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to subscribe and share all audio content, video content on this platform. And to help us preview this game today, we got Michael Bibbins, a.k.a. Bibbs. He's one half of the Mavs Outsider podcast. Mike. My man, Bibbs. What do you want me to call you, bro? How you doing today, man? How you doing? You can call me Bibbs. It's a lot shorter. Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Always about keeping the name short, man. Just rolls off the tongue much easier, but I'm glad that you're doing well. How are you feeling, man? You ready for this upcoming game this uh, this Saturday? I mean, it's been circled on the calendar since since the, the, the day Jalen Brunson uh, made his decision. So uh, a mm. lot of anticipation for this one. All right. Let's go. And... Hey, I mean, you brought it up already. So I guess we could start it off there. How do you feel watching this Mavs team right now, right? They're starting off. You got Luka Doncic still. This team's still doing, they're doing pretty well, even though they've had their moments when they're struggling. But how do you feel not having Jalen Brunson anymore? Yeah, so, you know, Jalen Brunson obviously drafted the same night as Luka. Um, I was high on both. I had I had graded Jalen Brunson as a mid-lottery talent. And um, so obviously I was excited to get them uh, guys that we could could build with for the future. But at the same time on draft night, I was like, you know, Jalen Brunson is going to want to run his own show at some point in his career. Like uh, I literally made the Kyle Lowry comparison. Like he's going to be mm -hmm. cool as a backup for a little while, but he's going to want to run his own show at some point. So, um, yeah, we definitely miss him for sure. Yeah. And, you know, like it's funny that you said uh, Kyle Lowry because when – during last season, when there were rumors that Brunson could be a Nick during the middle of the season, that's actually the guy I went to. I was like Kyle Lowry, Villanova product, guy who took time to develop throughout his course, you know, started off in Memphis, went to Houston, then went to Toronto. And that's where he really made his household name out there up in the north. And that's kind of how I feel about Jalen Brunson, man. He's just been a slow, steady guy, but he's been progressing every single season as a Knicks fan. He's by far our best player on this team, the most consistent player, best player creating his own shot. You know, he's held us, he's held us down, man. There's been a lot of close games. We lost a lot of close ones, three close ones so far. And it's really been thanks to like Jalen Brunson that the fact that we've been even in these games and most of these games throughout this season, just because of his playmaking, his ability to attack the paint, his footwork, uh, just a crafty player. I mean, I really, I just love when he's moving in transition and he can do that hop step, that sidestep and just swing his arms over to draw the foul. I love everything about it. And thank God, because for the last 20 years, the Knicks have not had a point guard and now we got somebody. So thank you as a Knicks fan. Thank you. This is not the first time the Mavs has helped somebody out. You helped us with a KP trade. You helped us with giving us Tyson Chandler. You've always helped us out. So I feel like you, you know, there's a nice connection between us and the Mavs. <laughs> there's certainly a connection. I don't know if I could call it nice from my end, but you know, <laughs> Thanks for Tim Hardaway Jr. You know. Oh no, no problem, no problem. I had enough. I had enough frustrations watching uh Tim Timmy like throw up a lot of shots here in New York. I think he was outcasted as a role as trying to be a second option out here, but I think he's been doing pretty well in Dallas. But you, 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 we'll, we'll talk about Tim Hardaway Jr. and and everybody else later in the show. But let me ask you about the Mavs season so far, man. Where do you feel about them right now? Like I said, they've been struggling a little bit. I think you guys just defeated the Warriors. It was a good win. How do you guys feel about it? So I'm I'm a little mixed. Uh, it's been rough these past few weeks. Like even when we were winning, we're right now we're a team that that shows up and plays to the level of our opponent. And it's it's 100 percent on Luca. Luca gets up to play the big teams like, again, you mentioned we beat the Warriors uh, the other night. Luca, 40 point triple double like he's going to show up for a game like that. Meanwhile, you go into Orlando and lose because Luca's lollygag and he's, he's throwing crazy highlight passes. He's not going to, for the jugular against teams like that. So um, I feel like we've had 13, 13 to 15 clutch games out of our 20 so far. Like every game is coming down to the wire and that's frustrating. Um, and it's also on Jason Kidd for, for sticking with guys who are not hitting shots. I think, Tim Hardaway Jr. and Reggie Bullock are in the bottom 10 in made, made uh, three field goal percentage and three-point percentage. And they're playing 25, 30 minutes a night. It's a lot of frustration on my end is what I'll say. I could go on, but I, I won't dominate <laughs> your pie with that. Hey, man, look, it's frustrating on this side, uh, on this end as well. I mean, as much as we love Jalen Brunson, he's been a great addition. 
the Knicks have been uneven in their play as well. I mean, they're 10 and 12 right now. We haven't, we've beaten a lot of teams that we're supposed to, like the Pistons. We've beaten the Hornets. We beat a lot of teams that are under 500. But when it comes to competing with the top end teams, like the Milwaukee Bucks, the Ca Cleveland Cavaliers, we've struggled as well. We've made them close or we've just gotten blown out. I mean, we even gotten blown out by the OKC Thunder before we get, returned the favor on their own home court. They put up 145, 145 points on us. So it's been uneven on this side as well. And that's where I say thanks to Jalen Brunson. I'm sure that's the guy who you're missing right now because he was truly Luca's Robin over there and, and help and help the Mavs get to that Western conference final. Right. Yeah. And it, and that's the sad part is, you know, when we made the, the trade to get Dinwiddie, it was, you know, this is insurance in case Brunson leaves, but it wasn't the, the idea coming into last year was that we didn't have enough ball handlers. So we went and got Dinwiddie. We had three ball handlers. It worked. It got us to the Western Conference Finals. But losing Brunson, you would expect that the front office would understand we, we still need that third guy off the bench to handle the ball if we're moving Dinwiddie into the starting lineup. And they told us we have Frank Nielakina at home. So, you know... The, the fans were like, are you serious? Like Frank Nielakina is going to show up and become Jalen Brunson overnight. Like, have you watched the same Frank Nielakina we've been watching? But, uh, oh man. <laughs> so that's, that's why we're, that's a big part of why we're in the situation we're in. Talk about uh, Matt Nick's West, man. That's, that's the joke that I have. Cause you talked about Reggie Bullock. You talked about Tim Hardaway Jr. Uh, now you guys, you got, you also got Frank Nolakina, as you mentioned. Now you also got Kemba Walker and you're talking about a third, you know, you need another ball handler coming off the bench. You got Kemba Walker. How do you feel about him, uh, joining the fold? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm in South Carolina, I'm 90 minutes from Charlotte. So I've, I watched a lot of Kemba Walker over the years. Um, I was actually in the building for his career high 60 point game when Jimmy Butler hit the buzzer beater to, to win the game after and ruin the night. Um, so I'm very familiar with Kemba Walker. Uh, I'm very familiar with the fact that he's had a rough past few years uh, health wise. And at the same time, he was playing starter minutes. He's playing 25 minutes a game, every game that he's played pretty much his entire career. I'm looking forward to, I'm glad we have a guy that can dribble. First of all, let me say that. Um, <laughs> And a guy who historically has been a pretty decent, at least three point shooter. And I'm hoping that by plugging him into a 15 to 20 minute a night role saves him on his knees a little bit. And we're able to actually use him in that role, come off the bench, score six to 10 points and, and just not have to worry about Josh Green trying to run point guard minutes or something. That's all and, I want from him. And, and you know, that's, I would have liked to seen that happen here with the Knicks. I think Tibbs totally mismanaged the Kemba Walker situation, especially once we lost Derrick Rose. And we lost Derrick Rose in December, too. And Kemba then came back into the fold. He was our starting point guard. And we, we during that time, it was just crazy because we lost a lot of players due to COVID, right? The, the health and safety protocol. So we were really running thin. I mean, I was... I live out here in Boston and I, I attended that Knicks game where it was Kemba Walker, Evan Fournier, Julius Randle. And we're, we had Julius Randle playing the three and we had Taj Gibson playing the four and Mitchell Robinson playing the five. It was quite, it was quite a sight to see. And we had, uh, what was it? Not uh, who, who's it? Uh, oh my goodness. I can't even remember right now. I can't remember. Uh, Wayne Selden. That's who it was. We had Wayne Selden getting some critical minutes <laughs> <laughs> out here and that's how bad it was. But then Kemba came yeah. back and, and we thought during last preseason Kemba was, going to be fine. We didn't take the Boston Celtics words, the fans, I should say, that his knees were shot. And then Tibbs ran him into the ground, especially throughout the month of December going into January. And Kemba had his games. Like Kemba had some really good games where you were just like, oh, is he back? Is he back? And I wish we managed it more because once we did lose Derrick Rose, I think Kemba could be a solid guard off the bench. I think he could have something special going out there in Dallas, especially if he's playing, you know, that 15 max 20 minute mark, I think he could still offer something, especially as a score. I think this team, what they were trying to do, like we need a guard who could play defense. We need guards in general. And for the Knicks, when you invest in Evan Fournier and Kemba Walker as your major premier signings of the off season, you can't just say we're benching, like, even though they bench Kemba Walker, you can't then bench the other guy, Evan Fournier. Like yeah. we made two massive mistakes. So I think it was a little difficult, like 
juggling over there for Tom Thibodeau in the front office, but I, I really hope that Kemba Walker has a good game because he I think he still has something left in the tank. I think he just needs the right opportunity and the right role. And I think that bench role is that do you like how hopeful are you that he can do that? Uh I'm 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 very hopeful. Um again, you can you can never predict health. And that's the major thing. I'm just hoping again that in having him in a smaller role allows us to manage his health. And we've had a pretty good track record of guys with with leg ailments and and getting them back healthy but between kp uh managing him pretty effectively even though he did get hurt again it was a non-contact thing or it was a contact injury i should say uh in the playoffs the in the bubble but then uh who was it dinwiddie last year you know got the rough start over in in washington mm -hmm. came back i think he had the quickest turnaround for anyone that ever had a, a injured that injury he had i think it was the acl had the quickest return to the court of anybody. You know, they were giving him a hard time about taking rest days in Washington, but he came over and he's he hasn't missed a, a beat since. And he, he looks amazing. So again, I'm hoping with our, our training staff and with that reduced role that he's going to be able to come in. And again, we don't need a ton. We just need somebody that can competently dribble the basketball for 10 to, 10 to 20 minutes, worst case scenario. And I think Kemba can at least do that as long as his legs work. I think so too. It'll be. Uh, do you think he's is he playing this game? Because I know he hasn't. I don't think he's played a game yet. Is he like? Is he slated to play against the Knicks? What's what's the uh, word on they that? They haven't officially said he will. They said they're going to look for an opportunity to kind of ramp him up. I know uh, after the game, kid was asked about it, and he said that uh, uh, they're going to get him on the court today, which was yesterday, and see where he's at basically before they make any decisions like that. I'm expecting, you know, we're playing the Pistons tonight. If, it, if we manage to do what we're supposed to do against a team like the Pistons, I could, I could definitely see him getting some clock at the end of the game just to get out there and get his feet wet. Um, but worst case scenario, I would expect we'll see him maybe in a week or so. Okay. And just for everyone knowing we're recording right now at 4 30 PM Thursday uh, afternoon, evening, whatever you want to call. So the Mavs hasn't, haven't played their game yet. The Knicks finished playing against the Milwaukee Bucks and lost a close one, like I said. So just to give everyone like an idea of what when we were talking. Getting back, you mentioned somebody that I need to ask you a question about. Uh -oh. Talked about injuries, KP, he's out in Washington now. What was what were your thoughts on, on that? Because Knicks fans, I mean, we, we when you do the Knicks fans dirty, we're going to have some animosity towards you for the rest of our lives. That's really how it is. How, what were your thoughts on having KP out there? What were your thoughts when he got traded? Give us the 411, man. So, yeah, you, you didn't have to explain the Nick fan thing to me because every time KP did anything, Knicks fans were all over it. So, <laughs> I, I, I understand. Uh, Mass fans have kind of adopted that a little bit. I personally am one of the exceptions. I, hmm. uh, coming into last season, it was very clear to me that Luca and KP were not a fit. Um, and not just basketball wise, they did not appear to like each other. Mm. They're two very different people on the basketball court and off it. And I just didn't, it, you could just tell they weren't on the same page at all at any point in time. So, you know, coming into the season, I, um, on the podcast, the Mavs outsiders, me and my co-host every year before the season, we do, uh, the Mavs outsiders play GM and we'll basically run through our ideal off season for what we want and during that episode i said you know trade kp for a bag of chips i really do not care i just want him off the team and i think i drew up like a trade for kevin love or something like that in in my off season so i wanted him gone when the trade went down it was hilarious to me because everybody was hot everybody was like you know this is terrible blah 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 i was celebrating um i didn't need any details to celebrate i was just glad he was gone um again nothing no animosity towards him. i'm very glad he's doing his thing in washington they seem very happy with him but i just wanted him off the roster because it wasn't it wasn't going to be a long-term fit and then i said you know if dinwiddie gives us anything it's a win and he gave us a lot and we <laughs> went to the western conference finals so yeah I, I have no animosity towards him no animosity towards brunson um, glad he's off the roster. Glad they're both doing well. But um, the KP trade, I'm one of the few that actually wasn't upset about that. You're and you're glad that KP's off the roster, not Brunson. Just just so. Uh, oh just no, so glad KP's off the roster. Yeah. Not glad Brunson's off the roster. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> not happy. Not excited about that one necessarily. But um, 
But yeah, KP, the only way that trade could have been better is if we had somehow gotten Denny of Dia or Rui Hachimara out of it. That would have made it perfect. But otherwise, just getting him out was a win. Okay. Well, you did have a good offseason signing. I think I like Christian Wood on this team. And I saw, I see there's been a lot of commotion about Christian Wood, um, especially with the utilization of, of like how Jason Kidd, I should say, is utilizing him. So what are your thoughts about uh, Jason Kidd so far coaching? Jason Kidd. Oh, man. Um, when we fired, or when Carlisle left, because he wasn't fired. When Carlisle left <laughs> and Jason Kidd was rumored as the next coach, I said, Jason Kidd is the last person I want to see us hire. Hmm. Um, and why is that? His track record is his track record. First year, good. Second year, bad. Second year, control freak, doing weird stuff. And uh, between that and, you know, I don't know if I should bring it up, but the domestic violence history, mm. considering our history as an organization with uh, domestic covering up domestic issues, it didn't feel like we should be going down that road. Uh, I know Mark Cuban is married to the two, like anytime he can reminisce and bring back 2011, he's going to do it. But I wasn't excited about the hiring. Mm. With that said, he came in last year. Mm. Took, took a little while, but the defense, uh, the defensive intensity was great. We had an amazing run. You know, I said I was going to give him a chance. I couldn't do anything about it once they hire him. So I said, I'll give him a chance. He did his thing last year. Now, yeah. we, get in, now we get into year two. And I, I'm, I'm going to try to keep this. I, I've had enough rants on my on the podcast <laughs> about, about it. I'm going to try to keep it calm. I don't understand what he's doing with his rotations. I don't understand what he's doing with people's minutes. Reggie Bullock, as I mentioned, has been the most brickiest brick in the NBA, shooting mm. under 30% from the field and from three. Doesn't do anything but shoot threes. His defense seems to have fallen off a little bit, mm. and he's still running out there putting up Tony Snell games for 30 minutes every single wow. game. And a night. Tony Snell reference. Woof. He, had, he had a Tony Snell night on, on Monday <laughs> against the Warriors. He played 15 minutes. He accumulated absolutely no statistics. It was 0 for 5. Like, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. But between that and then Tim Hardaway Jr. is the first guard off the bench. He's shooting barely 30% from three. Mm. Meanwhile, Josh Green shooting like 60%, and he's steadily getting his minutes – He'll get 15 here. He'll get 20 there. I think he got 30 the other night, but Red, Reggie Bullock was coming off an injury. So Christian Wood off the bench. He's our second leading scorer. Some nights he might play 15 minutes. Like the minutes do, do not make sense. It feels like the new guys, the young guys are having to actually compete to play while the entrenched guys, the guys that were playing 40 minutes in mm. the playoffs they just do whatever they want. It doesn't matter if they actually show up or not. Um, and it, it's it's frustrating as a fan to feel like your coach is not putting your best foot forward every night. You're speaking a lot of similarities over here with Tom Thibodeau, man. I mean, we complain about rotations too. I'll give, and there's there's credit to be given and there's also credit to be, uh, there's also criticism to be had when you watch the New York Knicks as well. And it's interesting you talk about rotations and lineups and stuff like that because we, we ask accountability for certain players. You know, we have RJ who's been struggling to find a shot. He's put up, he's had a stat line. He had a stat line of uh, what I think went five or six out of 20 shots. It's like he went either five or six for 20. And that's just, you can't, you cannot allow that to happen when you got other guys on the bench that you can go to if you're looking for some sort of offense. And on top of that, we ask for like, he's been, he's been staggering minutes here and there, like RJ with the second unit, sometimes Randall with the second unit, but it's the heavy utilization of the starters to always win the game. And I get that. I get that mindset, but you have to recognize when to adjust and when you need either more defense, like RJ is taking a step back defensively. And for some, for some, and including myself, I'd like to see Quentin Grimes and Cam Reddish out there. If you're, if you need some more defense, right. You still get some offense out there. Cam can do something off the dribble, especially could tack around the rim. Quentin Grimes, he's, he could be your connector. He can, he's a slasher. He does all those things. He plays solid defense, both play solid defense. And that's kind of the same frustration we have here watching the Knicks. It's like, why don't you put out like the best rotations, regardless of contracts and so forth like that, because we need it. Even with Obi Toppin, you know, we need somebody who's a spark off the bench, just out in transition, could be a runner, get you easy baskets. And we're like, 
where's that? And he's being spot like last against the Bucks. He, you thought it was Steve Novak out there uh, spotting up for threes. And it's like, come on now. Like that, that's not all of Obi's game. Can we get something else? So there's a lot of similarities too, which I'm looking forward to for this matchup because it will be interesting how to hear or how to see, I should say, uh, both coaches try to <laughs> out strategize one another. But like, well, like, give me an example of like what you would want to see happen as, as like from Jason Kidd, like rotation wise. So the the main thing that I've been talking about is Josh Green, um, and I was on it early. Maybe I was on it prematurely, but it was very clear that he's been play, out playing Reggie Bullock, and he's definitely out playing Tim Hardaway Jr. He's maybe our best point of attack defender. Um, I've watched him clamp up Anthony Simons and Dame Lillard back to back. You know, I watched him give Jordan Poole fits the other night. And I, I and he's been hitting his shots. You know, historically, he's been scared to shoot. You know, he put in work over the summer. He came back. He's got a he's got a he's launching it like the, mm -hmm. the other night. It was crazy. He uh, got a corner three. He shot it and was running up the court before it got to the rim. Like it was absurd to see, like knowing where he came from, scared to shoot. Like he got taken out of the playoff rotation because he wouldn't shoot the ball. Um He's playing defense, he's hitting threes, and he drives to the rim. Uh, somebody put out a statistic the other night that, you know, pretty much on our team, it's Luca, it's Spencer Dinwiddie, and nobody else drives. I think Reggie Bullock has seven drives the entire season, mm. uh, despite playing Sounds 20, about right. 29 minutes a game. <laughs> right. Um, and even Luke, I feel like Luca's been hinting that he wants more Josh Green minutes. Mm. Uh you look at rotations and like, if you look at three man rotations, our best three man rotation is Luca, Josh green, Christian wood. And it's only played like 50 minutes together. Something like that. Like they, the, the rotations make absolutely no sense. Josh green runs the floor. We're the slowest team in the league, slowest team in pace. Josh green runs the floor. Luca himself said, we maybe need to play faster. We need to get out and transition. All those guys, Reggie Bullock, Tim Hardaway Jr., Dorian Finney-Smith, Maxi Cleep, they're over 30. They're not running like that. Like, we need some young energy in there. So between either starting Josh Green or at least making sure he's getting 25-plus minutes a night and then either starting Christian Wood or making sure he's getting 25 to 30 minutes a night, that's, that's the main thing I want to see. And, you know, if you want to delegate the minutes based on performance, if Reggie Bullock is hitting, sure, keep him in there for 25 minutes. But if he's not, then maybe he only needs to play 15 that night. All right. So with all that said then, and knowing how the Mavs want to, you know, repeat last season's performance, like make it to the Western Conference Finals, or just trying to make a deep run in the playoffs in general, are you expecting the Mavs to be buyers before the trade deadline? <sighs> My faith in this front office is very low right now. <laughs> uh, it's very low. It's as soon as you you rush out in the free agency and sign Theo Pinson to a cheerleader contract, um, it's hard for me to take you seriously. It's another guy from the Knicks. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I don't understand what the, the goal is. I feel like we should be building a roster that is, yes, you have the vets because you want to push to win now, but you're also looking for young talent that can grow with Luca, and giving that young talent minutes. Uh, uh, Luca's contract's going to expire in five years. Those guys that are currently getting minutes will not be NBA players, most likely. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to be 35, 36, and they're already role players right now. Like They're not going to get better. Uh, they're not going to grow with Luca. So we need to be setting up that next wave. And so I would love for us to be buyers. Um, I think our last pod, our last weekly pod that we did on the Mavs Outsiders, we did a 10 buy low candidates. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for young guys under 28 that maybe aren't living up to expectations because uh, we don't have a ton of assets. So we need to go after, for example, like a Lori Markin in a couple of years ago would have been a guy that, you know, he has talent, but maybe he's not, maybe he's falling off. He's taking a step back. People are questioning whether or not he's, he is what he, they thought he was going to be. Cavaliers got him for the low, flipped him, turned him into Donovan Mitchell. Um, that's the type of thing that we need to be looking to do, find guys like that. Well, I'm rooting for you guys to find somebody and make the playoffs because we got your 2023 draft pick. <laughs> uh, and I need, I, we need that to convey. All right, man. So please, <laughs> for all of Knicks Nation, please make the playoffs so we can get that 2023 uh, pick to convey. But I, I feel you on, I feel you on um, the Mavs 
looking to try to make the playoffs and trying to be like, they should be buyers, but I also understand like your concern. I think like, wouldn't you be, shouldn't you say, shouldn't you feel confident in like this front office a little bit? Cause they did get Christian Wood who's been solid. And even though it's really just Jason Kidd and like how he's managing them. Yeah. So my question is, cause you know, uh, when we hired Nico Harrison to be the GM, he handpicked Jason Kidd. He said, I'll only come if Jason Kidd is my coach. Mm. But then with the Christian Wood thing, it looks like Nico Harrison made a move to get a guy and Jason Kidd doesn't like him uh, or doesn't think he fits what he wants to do. So now mm. I'm questioning, are they on the same page? Um, because, you know, you bring in Christian Woods, he's an expiring contract. You make him mm. upset, he's going to walk just like Jalen Brunson did. Mm-hmm. And so not giving him the minutes that he maybe probably deserves, I would say, uh, is is a question mark for me. So now I have to question whether or not my coach and GM are playing the same game here. Bibbs, you are speaking the same language as the Knicks. I mean, we're questioning our front office too. I mean, last season, outside of the Kemba and Fournier signing, we're wondering why did we trade for Cam Reddish? Now, don't get me wrong. Once again, like <laughs> Cam Reddish. Happy the Knicks got Cam Reddish. I'm saying this because I got attacked for 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 saying some things about Cam Reddish uh, on the last show. Uh, I'm in support of Cam Reddish. I like the idea, but it, when it comes down to Tibbs and um, not wanting that trade to happen, or it didn't seem like he was on the same page, I should say, should say, that's where I'm like, is this front office and the head coach on the same page? Because he didn't really seem like he wanted to play him. Now he's, you know, entered Tibbs' rotation because Tibbs realizes, oh, this kid can do something, <laughs> but there's just still so much going on where it's like, I think he he still needs to get more minutes. What he can offer this team is just, there, there's just untapped potential that needs to be figured out. And I don't think we're doing him justice and, and fig, team justice in general, seeing if we're getting the most out of Cam Reddish, if we're getting the most out of the young guys as well. So there's a lot of similarities between the Mavs and the Knicks. And thankfully, they're playing this Saturday matinee game that I, that I mentioned at the beginning of the show. So let's let's get into this matchup, man. There's a few matchups that I'm looking at, and, and for me, it's it's interesting. I'm th- I'm wondering how Tibbs is going to enter this game because obviously Luca is the main guy that you have to defend. Um, now last season it was a mix between Burks and RJ guarding him. I don't know if you want RJ guarding him now. And for me, I feel like it's either going to be Grimes who's going to be given that task. Or what I really think should be Cam Reddish should be in that starting rotation uh, for this game. You know, move Grimes to the bench for this one. What what Cam go out there because he has the length to guard Luka, Luka Doncic. That's what that's my thought process. The other matches I'm looking at is uh, Doris Finney Smith versus Julius Randle, Spencer Dinwiddie, and R.J. Barrett. I think that's up because Jalen Brunson he's going to be he'll be a mismatch for those guys. And I think the best solution is to put him on Reggie Bullock and let Reggie try to deal with Jalen Brunson. What do you think about those? Do you think those are like fair matchups? Yeah, I think that's probably your, your best bet. Uh, I like the Cam Reddish idea. I think Luca, as far as defending Luca, it's not a thing that you can necessarily do with one man, but mm-hmm. if it is going to be one man, you want that length. Um, and I think Cam is, he, he's not super skinny. Like McCall Bridges got bodied by Luca pretty easily. Mm-hmm. But I think Cam Reddish has a little bit more width to him. Um, I think having a guy like Mitchell Robinson over the top is also helpful. Uh, I, I find that the best defenses against Luka, if you're going to try to play him straight up, is when you have a guy with length and then you have a shot blocker underneath as well to come over and rotate and make Luka think a little bit. Um, as far as the rest, Reggie Bullock, Garden Reggie Bullock, if he's, I think Tim's going to start now. I think kid did say Tim is going to be the starter for a little while before he goes back mm. to Reggie Bullock, which again, frustrates me. Like, why are we marrying ourselves to going back to a 20% shooter? <laughs> but that's another story. Um, yeah. I think putting Jalen Brunson on Tim is easy because yes. all he's going to do is try to stay on the perimeter and look for barbecue chicken, to- baby. <laughs> throw up shots. Um, the Dorian Finney Smith Randall one is going to be interesting. I expect that we'll see a lot of Maxi Kleba to deal with, with uh, Julius Randall. Mm. Um, I think that's a better matchup for us. Now, are we going to let Julius Randle get off to a hot start because he's too big for Dorian Finney-Smith? That's going to be a, a Jason K question. So we'll see. Yeah, that, I mean that is a that is a question to see. But like, so with those matchups, like, what's the st- what's the play style of like the Mavericks? Like the Knicks, they're a team that loves to attack on the inside. We're we're terrible at shooting three. We're we're dead last when it comes to shooting three in the league. <laughs> what's the Mavs style play like? We like to attack on the inside. You know, between Brunson, RJ, 
and Randall, those are our three guys that really attack inside the paint. 15 and closer, that's what they love to do. RJ loves his flashing and likes to take threes. Randall likes his mid-range jumper, and on some nights he'll work the post. Brunson, you already know, right? He likes to get into the teeth of the defense, likes to get shifty and, and, and trying to finish around everybody. Um, what's the what's the Mavs play style? Yeah, so offensively, we almost let the opponent dictate how we play. Um, mm. How do you guard Luka is the first question. So if you're trapping Luka, now we're going to move the ball around and look for threes. If you're not trapping Luka, you're playing him straight up. He's most likely going to be aggressive, try to get inside. I think he's one of the top post-up players right now. So if mm. you are playing a one-on-one, he's going to get inside. He's going to get those easy baskets for us. And then from there, he'll look to, to work out to the shooters more. Uh, so inside out is what we want to do. That's how we want to play. But if if the defense does something that makes us have to play another way, we're going to start launching threes all day. Okay. Okay. Now moving on to the battle of the benches, right? And I think this is the biggest concern for 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 uh, Mavs fans. Although when you look at the stats, the Mavs are a better scoring team off the bench than the Knicks right now. The the Mavs are averaging 39.8 points with their bench while the Knicks are averaging 37 points. So not too far off. And the field goal percentage is 46, 46% for the Mavs while 43 or 44%, I'll say rounding up for the Knicks. Um, And obviously it comes back down to three point shooting. Mavs just shoot 35%, which is close to league average. And the Knicks are below league average shooting 32%. What do you think is this? What do you think? How do you think the the bench will fare against the Knicks right now? Because for me, I think this is the Knicks going to be the Knicks' strong point. Like if quickly gets hot, Derrick Rose is feeling it. Obi Toppin, you know, Cam Reddish, if if he's not if he's not starting, or if you have Quentin Grimes coming off the bench for the Knicks, it just seems like we, we like to get out there, run and gun a little bit. That's what that second unit likes to do. Really attack as well in transition. Yeah. So this is a uh, this is part of our issue. Is uh, Jason Kidd man trying to manufacture depth by leaving two of our best players on the bench in Wood and Josh mm. Green. Um, but because Luca, you know, slowest pace is because Luca holds the ball. When Luca comes off the court, a team that wants to speed us up, like you said, the Knicks are probably gonna try to do. I don't know if we should be running and gunning like that with that group. And we will try to. I mean, it just happened in the Warriors game where Luca came out, we had a 17 point lead. Luca came out, lead was gone almost immediately because the Warriors bench sped us up. They start running and gunning. They start hitting threes. They start getting layups. We have no paint protection. And if Christian Wood's not hitting, which happened in the Warriors game, then mm-hmm. we're not going to keep pace because that's the only way our bench is keeping pace is if Christian Wood is shooting at a ridiculous clip. Um, and if not, then we're going to be in trouble. Would you say like that the, the Mavs second unit starts to play a lot of isolation ball? Because I'm looking at the assist numbers and it feels like they really rely on like very few people while the Knicks second unit, like the ball kind of whips around, especially when they're in rhythm. That's the funny part is that I don't think people realize how that this is where Kimba Walker comes in, right? Hmm. So Spencer Dinwiddie, he's an ISO guy. He's not a playmaker. I, I'm watching him out there dribbling. He'll have, you know, Josh Green on the wing. He can't get it to him. He'll have Christian Wood in the post. He can't get it to him. He'll run a pick and roll. He can't get the ball to Christian Wood. Uh, He's a scorer, and he shouldn't have to be put in a position to have to completely facilitate. Last year, it was Brunton and Dinwiddie together. Brunton's a little bit better of a facilitator, as you know, but now it's just Dinwiddie, and it's a rough thing to watch as a Mavs fan when when it's just him out there as a point guard. Yeah, usually it's Derrick Rose who's leading the attack. Although he's been up and down so far this season, it's usually Derrick Rose leading the attack, being the playmaker for this. Quickly has done a good job here and there, depending on if he's in that mindset for the Knicks second unit when it comes to attacking. Uh, if you have Grimes with the second unit, he also helps with uh, some passing and playmaking as well, especially when it comes to looking for bigs inside the paint. He has He's really good at get, finding that dump-off pa- pass. And then Hartenstein, we haven't really utilized him, but he could be a passer too. He really can be. Um, but Obi can pass as well. Everyone on that team, everyone on that second unit just loves to pass. And I feel like with the for against the Mavs and not being good in transition, as you know, I feel like that's going to be the bench's strength if they can really hone in on that. Obviously, it all comes down to making shots at the end of the day, but I feel like for the Knicks, that's where it's going to have to come towards. Now, to get you out of here, uh, Mike, what is what is your what's your score prediction for this game? 
I expect Luca to play 40 minutes. Woo! Uh, <laughs> And I expect the score to be somewhere uh, in the range of, let's say, 105, 102 Dallas Mavericks, Luka, with the step back at the buzzer to take it home. Mm. I'm going to have to go against that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to go 108 to 102. Because to be honest, man, Knicks have been on a three-game winning streak when it comes against the, the Dallas Mavericks, all right? We've won the last three uh last season we won both games two seasons before uh, a season before that we split the series and before that going back to 2019 2020 season we got you both times so i got the knicks winning this one 108 102 knicks are gonna do it um something tells me it's either going to be julius randall you know showing out against his home team or jalen brunson with a nice little revenge game either way that's that's how i'm feeling about it but Bibbs, thank you for coming on the show. Please let Knicks Nation know where they can find you and all of your content. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Bibbs Corner. Uh, spelled exactly how it sounds. Uh, Mavs Outsiders Podcast is the podcast. Myself, my co-host, Reese Williams, at Mind Reese. Um, you can find us on Instagram, Mavs Outsiders Pod. And uh, hopefully we'll start posting some more video content out there. Awesome. Thank you for coming through once again, Bibbs. And to Knicks Nation, salute to all of you for checking in. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to share all this, all this content, audio, visual. Make sure to share it. Cut it up. Do whatever you got to do to it. Share it with your friends. Share it with your family members. Share it with your dog. Share it with your cat. All right. They all need to see this great Knicks quality content. And also remember, this show is presented to you by KnicksFanTV.com. And make sure to go check that, that website out. You can always check out Remy's Recap. He always recaps the entire game if you miss it. So it's a great, great read. Goes into detail about every single Knicks player from the first starters and the bench unit and how they play it and gives you his ratings. Make sure to check that out. And we'll catch you, Knicks Nation, for post-game after the Knicks play the Dallas Mavericks. We out. <laughs>